Street Knowledge with Chris Graham. Welcome to the podcast. Chris Graham and I got Jerry Carter on the line. It's a Friday afternoon, and this is always a good cap to mind week. Hopefully, for you listeners out there, it is for you as well as we sort of, you know, catch up on what has gone on in sports this week and then get you ready for the weekend. And uh, Jerry, I have to ask, how are things going for you? Well, I. Chris, I haven't stopped smiling for last night. Uh, was very happy to see Daniel Jones get into the game, go five, five, get 67 yards, and then and uh, and a touchdown. So still have to be admit, admit to be smiling from that just a little bit. And uh, and on the other end of it, uh, Jamison Crowder with a touchdown in the same game. So last night was a last night was a good sports night, but. Uh, Always a pleasure to talk with you, and I got a handful of things on on my side of the fence. But I wanted to ask you uh, when this popped up last week, according with uh, with your wrestling background, I saw that Harley Race had passed away, and it was one of those things to where you know the, the little you know bottom line on ESPN, if you will. And I got to thinking, I said, I, I know the name, but I don't know that much. I said, I bet Chris Graham knows a little bit about Harley Race. So what could you tell the listeners about what this man brought to the uh, sport of wrestling? Yeah, if you're a casual a casual fan, you know a little bit about wrestling, or you at least know some of the names from the past, the Hulk Hogan names and that kind of thing. You know, the, the name Harley Race, you'd see it on a, on a, a scroll like that and say, well, okay, who was this guy? What was his significance? Well... Harley Race was the eight-time NWA, National Wrestling Alliance, world champion, uh, primarily 70s and 80s. And um, he's, a, he's really a throwback to that, that different era of pro wrestling where, you know, now it's wink, wink, nod, nod. We all acknowledge that, that pro wrestling is, is fake. It's a work. It's always been that, at least dating back to the very early days of, of the, the carny wrestling that's you know date back to the early 1910s 1920s but and and for the longest time it wasn't acknowledged you know there was enough kind of like magic you know you're out in vegas jerry you go to a magic show you don't want to think about the fact that what you're what you're seeing is 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 artistry you're thinking hey they're you know you want to think at least while you're watching the show those card tricks are real you know, when they saw the woman in half it's real you know and and Wrestling back in, in, in the era when Harley Race was, you know, the world champion, he may have been one of the last guys, actually, of that era where we still had that uncertainty about whether or not it was real or fake. And Now, a fun thing about Harley Race, you know, if you've, if you've seen pictures of him, if it, with any of the stories that kind of popped up in your news feeds or Twitter or whatever else, you look at him, you'd look at him and say, boy, he didn't look like the wrestlers of today. Wrestlers of today look like bodybuilders. You know, they got muscles on top of muscles. They have no body fat. And Harley Race, I mean, he wasn't a fat guy. He he just he was he was solid. He you know kind of built like the offensive lineman, college football offensive lineman that he was. Uh, and uh, but you know yeah, he didn't have the the rippling muscles or anything else. But what he did have, he was a legit tough guy. Uh, in an era of wrestling when the world champion was decided by a, a group of promoters who said, all right. Basically, the world champion of that era would go from territory to territory. There were territories all over the country. Pacific Northwest was a was a promotional territory. California had its own promotional territory. Georgia, Florida, the Mid Atlantic. There were about twenty twenty two of these these territories that had their own uh, champions. They had their own stories and everything else. And the NWA world champion would travel from territory to territory and take on the top guy there. On Friday night in your hometown, and uh, he did that all year round. You know, so four or five nights a week, actually. This Harley Race would be in some town somewhere, some territory somewhere, defending his world title. Uh, uh, issue with with having a having a champion like this was, yes, wrestling was scripted then too, but when you put those guys out there uh, in front of a live crowd. Uh, you're relying on them to act out the storyline that you gave them. And it's not uncommon when you look back in wrestling history that sometimes the local guy said, you know what, I think I want to be the world champion tonight. And so you had to make sure when you were these this group of promoters uh, signing a world champion that 
the guy you assigned to be the world champion, if the local guy on a Friday night in your hometown decides, you know what, I think I'd like to be the NWA world champion tonight, uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take it from him, whether or not the storyline requires it or, or, or allows for it or what. Your world champion had to be able to break kayfabe, as we say, the uh, fake, the uh, the pig Latin for fake, uh, and. He had to be able to beat the other guy up, pin him, and walk out of town with the championship. Harley Race was one of those guys. That's why he was eight-time champion. For about 15 years, he was the top guy in the business because he was tough enough to go into your hometown on Friday night and guarantee he would leave your hometown on Friday night as world champion. So that's a different era of wrestling. It's, it's so different than what we have now where it's, it's, it's you know bright lights, big cities. The guys end up being on – in movies after it's all over with. Back then, they were tough guys, and Harley Race was the toughest of the tough guys. Well, my first thought in listening to you describe uh, uh, Harley, because if you were going to take a modern-day uh, action hero-type character for the, for the people listening to relate to, who, who out there in the movies now or in the wrestling world would give you the best comparison to Harley Race? Boy, you know, in movies now, I mean, I'm not even sure of movies now because I'm, I'm thinking Clint Eastwood or, or, or uh, Chuck Norris or something like that. And they weren't big guys, so, I mean, you know, but they were they were reputed tough guys. You know, at least the, the characters they played were tough guys. Uh, because to even, even movies today, the action heroes are those same guys, the muscle guys who look good. You know, Harley Race didn't get to be the NWA World Champion because he could sell posters. <laughs> you weren't going to put his... His his mug on a on a, ch- a kid's lunchbox, uh, but uh, he would he would put his he, he would put his fist through a lunchbox if he had to to win that world title. So I think yeah the, the Chuck Norris's uh, the the Clint Eastwoods, you know he actually bore a striking resemblance to uh, and, and this guy actually uh, made it kind of into movies for a brief time. But you might remember the boxer Randall Tex Cobb who was a heavyweight contender back in the early eighties. Uh, they could they could have been. They, they could have been twins, uh, you know, twin twin sons of different mothers kind of thing. Uh, I, the only movie I really remember uh, Randall Tex Cobb being in was actually the comedy movie Raising Arizona, where he played a a, uh, a biker from hell uh, in that comedy. Uh, but that might be the closest approximation. And I'm, I'm mentioning a movie from 30 years ago, so that might not be very helpful. Well, I think that it made me smile because I remember the movie uh, really well there. <laughs> Again, Harley Race has, uh, is no longer with us, and he touched uh, a number of lives uh, along the way, and obviously quite a few of them in a physical manner. Yeah. <laughs> hey, the, uh, the, the, the next thing, Chris, real quick, is I have to – we're going to start calling Charlottesville the uh, city of champions before too long. I noticed uh, in the BBL that the uh, Tom Sox actually captured their – second BBL championship in a limited uh, amount of time in the league and uh, another trophy going across the mountain. Do you have any thoughts on on the success that the Tom Sox are having? Yeah, you know, uh, I remember the group when they got together, I was still working with the Waynesboro Generals. The folks there reached out to our folks uh, to just kind of run some thoughts by uh, as to, you know, getting started. So I, re- I remember, I mean, I had a, a, a trying to think who the guy was, uh, Joe McElhaney, a uh, former UVA baseball player, a uh, former All-American UVA baseball player, was part of that group at the time. Uh, I mean, so I, I remember that team when it was literally just getting off the ground. Uh, and I want to say this was their sixth season, so, so two championships in six seasons is nothing to sneeze at. Uh, this year's playoffs, Jerry, you're a Valley League guy. You you know the league well. Uh, this year's playoffs were marred a bit by something that we always have an issue with, players leaving early. Uh I don't want to say the, the Waynesboro Generals team that we both were affiliated with uh, together, in fact, too, uh, had the league's best record in the regular season, 31-11, lost in the first round of the playoffs to the Stanton Braves. Uh, Braves players then, uh, apparently, they didn't think they were going to get past the Generals because a lot of those guys left town after that first round series. They only had 10 guys on, on, the, on the team for their second round series with the Tom Sox. Uh, and... Uh, Patrick Hyde, the news leader, wrote a nice column uh, where he, he talked to quite a few folks up and down the valley uh, to get a sense of 
uh, what needs to be done to correct for this in the future. And, and Patrick's conclusion, and I actually wrote a column kind of countering Patrick's conclusion, but his conclusion was shorten the season, which I made the point, all right, you can shorten the season, but one, the Cape Cod League still playing. In fact, Cape Cod League doesn't finish this weekend. They finish next weekend. Uh, the Northwoods League finishes next week. Northwoods plays 72 regular season games, then they play playoffs. The Valley plays 42 and then playoffs. Uh, I'm not sure it's shortening the season, but I can't tell you what it is, Jerry. I mean, it's been something – our first year together was actually we, – we, we met each other in 2008 uh, when you were doing your Around the Valley in 60 Days. Uh, you know, w this has been an issue even before that in terms of the Valley League losing guys early, uh, but the Northwoods doesn't. The Cape Cod League doesn't lose players early. So that, that was an issue, and, and I'm not saying that Charlottesville only won because of that issue. But it is the case, I and mean, we've, we've seen this many years, that you know everybody plays hard in a regular season. You get to that, you get to the playoffs, and it's really like a second season, and it's it's really a matter of who has the, the most complete roster. That kind of determines generally who wins those championships. So, Chris, I really think that the the issue is still the issue that I was making the point of it being an issue for about a decade now. Chris, one of them is it's the odd number of teams. So by having an odd number of teams, the league went from 12 to 11. And when you have an odd number of teams, it, it makes your schedule, uh, there's a hole in it every night. There's, a, there's a, a night off every night to where it takes you a little bit longer for everybody to get to play the 42 games. Um, and I, I don't see anybody on the uh, on on the outside looking in sat now saying, "Hey, let me let me get in there." But I do believe that's one of the you know one of the issues. In it, it takes so much longer to play uh, the regular season because you've got somebody sitting at home uh, each night, uh, and, and it's it's kind of funny from that standpoint. I what, where you don't lose it from people going home, you also you're also dealing with a number of injuries at the end of uh, at the end of the summer as well, and uh, that was something that tripped up the uh, you know Jay Neal and the Strasburg Express um, this season. By the time they got to the uh, the second round of the playoffs, their uh, pitching was. Uh, was a mess. Yeah, you know, I, I guess what I'd say is I, I, I also proposed in the comment I wrote about this that some of this, some of the issue might be the, the cachet issue, the Q rating, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, guys don't leave the Cape early. They're not, they, they don't have the problem because if you leave the Cape, uh, you know, that's, that's the top league in, in summer baseball, summer college baseball. Uh, you're not leaving the Northwoods early. That's the second best league in summer baseball. Um, I don't know how the Valley overcomes the perception because the Valley for a long time used to be considered, if not on par with the Cape, uh, right there, you know, right there, just a, a sliver behind. And, uh, you know, we've had World Series MVPs and, and first round picks and everything else come out of our league. But I don't know that the cachet is there now. Uh, we've got to make it so because you know we 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 both know the way the the league works. The guys actually sign contracts. You know, theoretically, uh, the uh, the coach of the Generals or the Braves or whoever could could say to the college coach that assigned players to their teams in the in the summer, "Hey, your guys are leaving me early every year. I don't want any more of your guys. Uh, you know, you got to you got to police your guys uh, uh, more." Um, and if, if you enforce that, then, of course, the, the coaches want players to play in the Valley because it's a good league. Uh, they'll make sure their guys stay longer. But, you know, I, I would guess our, 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 our teams aren't doing that. You know, they're not pushing it like that. They should. But uh, it's, it, is, it is a problem. I mean, it, it, and I think the fact that the players are leaving early only further reduces the, the cachet of the league because it, it, it kind of comes across as, well, they're not important enough to worry about their playoffs. Yeah, for, for the people who are fans, those playoffs are important. And so when only 10 guys are on the roster, I mean, the Braves had to play four pitchers in position uh, roles. That's embarrassing for the league. It's embarrassing for everybody associated with the league. 
it almost why do we even have playoffs if they're gonna if you if you're gonna have to field it? And, and I'll say this too: if I'm a college coach, I don't want to hear that my pitcher's playing third base. I didn't send him to you to play third base, and so that had there there, there are a lot of issues unpacked from that. Uh, but we you know the league has to work on it because I mean it's it's something that's it's it's been a years long issue. Yeah, it's been a it's been an issue for. Uh... For as long as I can remember, and I well, my affiliation with the league started, I want to say right at 16 years ago now, and uh, it, it's kind of interesting. You mentioned Charlottesville has uh, managed to capture two in a very short period of time. Uh, on the, in the same thought process, the Strasbourg Express have also now they fell short this year in the championship series, but they've also won two in a very short period of time. So you've got four of the last seven or eight uh, titles that have been won by teams that are relatively new to it versus some of the uh, the old school teams. But you can't talk, Chris, you can't talk about the Valley Baseball League. You did not talk about somebody that I think we both consider uh, a character larger than life. And that being Mike Bocock. Yeah. And it, it's a situation where we, ever since we mentioned a few weeks ago that fellow friend of ours, Bill Mead, is trying to work on a book with Mike, it, it's been a situation to where there had actually been some some separation in that Mike had taken stepped, stepped away from the BBL and became the commissioner of the Rockingham County Baseball League. And that changed this year um, at the, towards the end of the season. I, I realized he was actually coaching the Woodstock River Bandits yeah. Yeah. and got them to the uh, to the edge of, of the championship series. They ended actually one game one against Strasburg. But for people out there listening that haven't had the opportunity to hang out with Mike Bocock the way that you and I have, what would be your what would be your favorite Mike Bocock sport? Uh, it's probably one that it was, it's definitely one that got him in trouble. Uh, when you when you say it that way, you, you have to be honest with the first thought that comes to mind. Um, uh, in the 2013 season, uh, the one season he spent as as the uh, the coach of the Waynesboro Generals, won a championship, uh, and that was such an up and down season. You know, we had we were. I was I was still the play by play announcer for the team that year and, and uh uh the team barely made the playoffs. Uh I, I wanna say we didn't clinch our playoff work until the next to last day of the regular season. We were the eighth seed. And um uh you know, I'll 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 go ahead and reveal this now because it doesn't matter, it's fun. Uh he asked me, you know, with my work, I mean with Augusta Free Press, we we design websites, I do video work. Uh, these podcasts and, and the work I do with ESPN3 now, that's easy because they do all the video work. They, you know, they, this is this is easy stuff. But uh, for the generals, I, I did the play-by-play. I, I shot videos after games of players and coaches and, and put it up on the website. So he said, hey, Chris, I need some help. We, we finished eighth in the league this year. Getting ready to play the Harrisburg Turks. Harrisburg Turks had a really good team. They had you know, three or four kids from, from ACC schools, Duke and Wake Forest, who, who, who went on the, the next year to, you know, play in NCAA tournaments. I mean, they were a great team. And uh, they had beaten us. I, I want to say I, we only played them five times that year because of a rainout issue, but we uh, they scored double digits in four of the games. They beat the heck out of us all year long. Hey, Chris, I need you to create a, a motivational video for me and have some fun uh, with Mr. Weiss, if you will. Uh, with this video, because only the only the kids are going to see it. So we worked together on that thing, and we sat up half a night. And actually, it might have been more than half a night. And uh, I, gosh, we 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 had a lot of fun with Bobby Weiss. And Bobby, if you're, like, we designed the website for for Teresa and Bobby for the Turks. And, uh, but we we kind of cast for the players. We cast Bobby as uh, Darth Vader and played the music. You know, you know the, the Darth Vader entrance music and everything else. And when we showed that video to those kids, those to a to a player, they were ready to run through the brick wall and go tackle the Harris of Turks, much less play baseball and beat them. And we beat them in two games. We ran through the playoffs, went six and one in the playoffs. We created a different video each round, then you know, motivational video each round. 
Uh, but just, you know, X's and O's baseball, I mean, but Mike Bocock has forgotten more than you and I combined, who are both baseball knowledgeable people, will ever, will ever know. I mean, he, he's, he's got all that X's and O's stuff. But he, he knew that he had to get his team psychology. So I mean, we're sitting in the press box at Kate Collins Field, getting ready to get on the bus to go to Harrisonburg for that first game, watching this video together. He had me bring in a big screen TV to show it on, uh, you know, and hook it up in the press box and all this stuff. And and the video was played three or four minutes long. We included clips from the major, you know, the movie Major League, uh, where and that's where we actually ended it. We started with Bobby being the Darth Vader guy. We finished it with the the uh, the catcher uh, in, in the movie saying, "There's only only one thing for us left to do. Forgive me for saying it this way, folks." He said, "There's only one, one thing left for us to do is to win the whole fucking thing." And you could have heard a pin drop when when the when the video went off again. They wanted to go. They wanted to go. They wanted to run to Harrisonburg and win a baseball game. They didn't want to take a bus. They wanted to run to Harrisburg and win a baseball game. He 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 knew he knew he knows because he's still he's still coaching and coaching well. He knows how to hit, hit, get the pulse of his team, and uh, you know that's I, I sat my, I had the fortune that that year. Our our uh, broadcast box was also the coach's room. Uh, our situation here at Kate Collins Field, small press box. And so I'm in there at 5 o'clock each night, 7 o'clock start of the game, getting set up for my broadcast and everything else. He, he's having his meetings with his coaches and everything else. Boy, just sitting in that room with those coaches all summer long, I learned so much about baseball from those guys. So, you know, I, and I like to think that what I've been able to do since uh, in terms of my broadcast career, especially baseball broadcasting, is a lot because of that summer. So I, I owe a lot to Mike Bocock in that sense. Yeah, Mike Bocock, uh, I, had, I had to spin the clock back from your 2013, and uh, it, was a, it was a minority role for me, but uh, part of the ownership group for the 2008 uh, Luray Wranglers. And, uh, of course, I say minority, but getting to hang out that year with Mike Bocock uh, taught me so many things, and one thing he does and similar to what you just described, his ability to rally his team in the us against the world mentality was it was absolutely unbelievable. Um, and it, it would be hard to narrow it down to a handful of examples. But the other piece to the puzzle back then was the recruiting. And by that point, uh, Bocock had, uh, and to me, still is. He is one of the legends of our valley, and he's also a legend that nobody has never left. And you're you're sitting there, so he would have the ability to go out and get 25 players, and not only get 25 players, but if something happened to one of them, he would just plug somebody else in and. And we're, we're sitting there going through and watching him and watching how do his antics and his excitement. Uh, he got those kids so fired up that they played every night as if, you know, almost as if their life depended on it. And that was probably, that was arguably the best season in my memory for a DBL team because that's when Larray actually got into the national teams and had a chance to play uh, in a double hitter with um, uh, the Waynesboro Generals also came up and played a game against some of the other uh, powerhouse teams in the national rankings. And with Mike Bocock, it's just for every great story, there's, there's a, a shaded story, but uh, he really is somebody who's larger than uh, – larger than life, and the amount of baseball, as you said, that he's forgotten uh, is, is entertaining. But the, the funny part for me was, you know, when Bocock, I, I, I related to when Pete Rose was playing. If Pete Rose played for your team, you loved Pete Rose. <laughs> if Pete Rose was playing against you, you couldn't stand Pete Rose. And it was a situation to where I had to smile when when Pocock came down to Waynesboro 
in 2013. And I, and I, you know, again, wait, it was just another group of people who didn't like Mike, didn't like Howie. His ability to stack a lineup in his and back then was incredible. I, I distinctly remember a game where we were needing a, a shortstop. And if I, if I was better prepared, I could tell you the name of the young man. And he came, uh, he, he came up, his dad drove him up. Uh, from uh, LSU, Stad drove him up. They threw a jersey on him in the parking lot, and without taking, being able to take BP, uh, he actually went on the first night and hit two home runs. <laughs> this was after getting out of the getting out of the car. Yeah. And you're sitting there, and it goes back to what you were talking about uh, about the league, the, 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 where the BBL is concerned, is. I think the I think the EBL needs the Mike Bocock. I, I think it's a it's a credibility uh, rod, if you will, to where that when you have somebody that at that level of a uh, of a coach and that level of a presence, people want their kids to get a chance to uh, to soak some of that in. Yeah, I was gonna before we before we get off the Mike Bocock topic, the other story. This is probably the better story, and this is. I'm telling it as authentically as I can based on the way Mike told the story to me once. Um, but it's about, about a guy. He talked about a, a guy coming, you know, driving in the middle of the night, not taking batting practice, hitting two home runs. And, and his and Mike's ability to find these guys and, and plug them in, just a seemingly endless supply of talent. Uh, one of the one of the years he was with the Lou Ray Lang, uh, Wranglers, I, I want to say it was 2005. Uh, he was in need of a second baseman, and uh, early in the season, you know, that happens a lot. You know, you uh, early for, for the listeners out there, summer baseball is always such a fluid situation. You know, the first two weeks are usually coinciding with the first couple of rounds of the NCAA tournament. So, you know, guys you recruited and, and nurtured relationships with all all you know winter and spring long, they're not there yet, and you you got to still field a team because our season has started up here. So. Uh, you're always scrounging around trying to find guys to plug gaps and tell whenever you know your full team gets there. Well, so he needs a second baseman. So uh, he calls around, and there's a guy in playing in a, a, a league several uh, layers below in West Virginia, a guy named Daniel Murphy, who played at Jacksonville. And uh, Murphy didn't get a lot of at-bats that first year at Jacksonville. That, that's often the case. Summer baseball is where you kind of cut your teeth. I mean, you, we find a lot of guys in, in places like the Valley League where, uh, you know, they, they didn't play much as fresh, maybe even as sophomores. They have a great summer in the Valley, and then they go off and become stars. Um, happens a lot. Um, so anyway, Murphy Murphy's in his league. He's playing in his league in West Virginia a few hours away from Lou Ray, and Mike needs a second baseman. And so he's, his people told him, call Daniel Murphy. So he calls Daniel Murphy, and he says, okay, I need you. Uh, can you. Can you get over here? Uh, well, coach, I didn't – I don't have a car. Well, how did you get from Jacksonville to West Virginia? I rode over with a teammate, one of my teammates from Jacksonville. Okay, so he, Mike sends, in the middle of the night, he sends his, his uh, nephew, Brian, who ends up playing in the major leagues himself. Uh, Brian Bocock played shortstop with the uh, San Francisco Giants, Kansas City Royals. He's now a coach, uh, major league, uh, minor league coach. Uh, but he sends Brian over. Uh, he, pick, he picks up Daniel Daniel uh, comes back. Now he didn't have quite the first night that the story you had. He didn't. He didn't. You know, get out of the car and hit two home runs. The way Mike tells the story, first night he goes over four, has a couple errors uh, in the field at second base. He, he's got a. He said, "Kid, he doesn't have a. He doesn't have, doesn't have range. He's got no throwing arm. You know. So second night he goes over three with a with an error. So he's he, he Bocock tells the story. Man, you know." You know, it's 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 one of those situations. You sign you sign a guy for a, a ten day contract. Uh, Mike can't wait for those ten days to be up. He wants you know he's he's waiting for his 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 preseason uh, recruited second baseman to show up from the NCAA tournament. Third night, Murphy hits two home runs, a three run homer to win it, uh, walk off. Daniel Murphy goes on to be the Valley League MVP that year, and then he becomes Daniel Murphy. You might have heard of a guy named Daniel Murphy. Uh, started with the Mets. Uh, Nats the last couple of years. Now I think he uh, Chicago got traded to. I think he's with Colorado now. Great career, but he was he was one more 0 for three with an error away from 
not playing in the Valley League anymore. So it, the, those kind of stories, I mean, it's a, it's a great story, but it's also indicative of of what our league's all about. Uh, you know, it's, it, a guy's going to – you know, Jerry, my favorite movie of all time, if you had to pin me down, Field of Dreams. And there's this scene where they're, the guys are driving in the van and they pick up the young Archie Graham who says, you know, excitedly when he jumps in the van, I hear that there are towns – where you can play baseball and work a job, and uh, you know the, 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 the whole town comes out to watch the game, and I want to play in one of those leagues, that's the Valley League. And that story right there kind of really indicative of what that league's all about. Well, I'll sneak in before we jump off of the, you know, the Bocock train. I'll sneak in two more. <laughs> Back in uh, 2008, you know, being, again, one of the minority owners of the team, it was a situation where I had a lot of access to the kids and, was having a lot of fun with the blog, the uh, Around the Valley in 60 Days blog. And I got to meet this young man who wasn't with us at the start. And the same people that will know who Daniel Murphy is. The night that uh, I met Yonder Alonzo, uh-huh. I was sitting there thinking in my mind, I'm going, wow, if this guy, if the, if the bus had a flat tire, I'm thinking this guy, could pick up the back of the bus and change the tire. And he had a pretty nice uh, major league baseball career too, but he was just a, he was a great guy to actually uh, to get to know and get to hang around a little bit. But my, my last uh, uh, book story was, was probably my personal favorite. It was a situation to where I was doing uh, high school football games on the radio. Uh, there in your part of town, and uh, with Chip Grable, and it was a situation where at the same time, Mike Bocock, now most people don't know this, but Bocock as a youngster was a phenomenal quarterback, which you know what, he might be puzzled by that, but Mike was there, and Mike would do uh, the color for the TV games. So we would end up in the, in the booth sitting uh, you know, side by side, and we're sitting there one night, and we're doing a game. I guess I want to say it was at Waynesboro, but we're doing a game, and what Chip Crimble would always do with us is at halftime he would uh, he would take a break, and I would do the the ten minute halftime, and I would fill it with whatever was relevant at the time. And so on this given night, Mike was in a similar situation. He's getting a break from the color, and without a without a a pre thought to it, I just tapped Mike on the shoulder and said, "Hey, what do you say if we lighten up the night of high school football with the Valley Baseball League talk?" And we just inserted ten minutes worth of uh, worth of stories talking about the league, and that was the one thing that'll be my last memory of Mike is the fact that how much he cares about the game, how much the game matters to him. Now, obviously, he'd he'd like to win the game. You know, if there's a game, he wants to win the game. But his level of respect for the game reminds me a great deal of uh, another common person of ours is uh, uh, Ness is somebody who has so much respect for the game. You've got to play it the right way. You've got to dress the right way. You've got to act the right way. So Mike Bocock, if I will, if Bill me does get a chance to finish the book, I think it'll be a good read, and uh, and it'll be full of stories. And there we we could be, we could barely scratch the surface with Mike Bocock stories. But you mentioned um, your favorite movie. It also happens to be one of my favorite movies, Field of Dreams. And that brings me up to the next question. And I want to put it in a uh, – take your reporter cap off for a second and be a fan. And my question to you is how much money would you pay for a ticket to the game that's going to get played there next year? Mm-hmm. Uh, they were they just announced. Now, the, the real quick note for those who don't know it, the actual field they use for the MOOC is still there. Um, but what, what they're going to do is the New York Yankees 
are going to come there and play what would be a home game for the Chicago White Sox. And the, the, the field itself doesn't have proper seating. It only has metal bleachers and it's some limited. So they're actually going to build a stadium, uh, 8,000-seat stadium, next to the field, have it be the Field of Dreams game, and what would it be worth to you to be one of 8,000 people that get to see that take place? Uh, it, it, the, the price is, I'm sure, because there's only going to be 8,000, and it's, it's a once-in-a-lifetime, I assume, once-in-a-lifetime kind of thing, um, the ticket prices are already going to be out of any anybody listening to this podcast's price range, <laughs> I have to say, unfortunately, because there's only 8,000, but man, just the, the idea of this. Uh, it's so Major League Baseball is doing some really neat things. They, they've been playing that Little League uh, Little League World Series theme game. They're going to do that again this year. The two games over in London this year. Uh, I love that they're doing these things. G- getting back to baseball's roots. Um, yeah, you know, the, the opportunity to go to this game. I mean, I don't know, but it, it, the idea that they're that, that baseball wants to connect with with fans of this movie. I mean, I, even just thinking about the movie, I know. I'm trying to think how long it is usually. It's been a couple years since I last watched it, which means I've got to watch it again. Uh, but uh, soon, because, uh, you know, the, the emotion of it, it's usually about 10, maybe 12 minutes in before I start tearing up, and then I just blubber the rest of the movie. Um, uh, it's So I imagine it would, you know, I wouldn't be watching the game as much as I'd be trying not to blubber, I guess. <laughs> Can I have a catch? Uh, that kind of thing. Um, but what, what a, I just love that baseball... Uh, Major League Baseball is trying to reconnect uh, to so many different sort of roots kind of things for fans, and what a, what a great opportunity for the game, and hopefully it's it's a success, and they'll want to do it every year. Well, Chris, I thought the key to it that, that it was a subtle key, but the key to it is is the fact that it's the White Sox, yeah. and if, if anybody who remembers the movie, you it, it's full of the White Sox players that were part of the Black Sox scandal. And it was, I, I just thought, what a touch. I, I don't know. I mean, you could have said, okay, we're going to play the Yankees and the Red Sox there. To me, it wouldn't have been as cool as having the White Sox play a game there. And it, it'll be interesting to uh, to see. I, I Because they're building a permanent deal, I don't see it as a one and done. But I don't know how much... Um, you, know, you and I talk a lot about how much money is involved in things right now. I, I don't know from a, a financial hit that giving up a home game would be for uh, you know for the White Sox. But they also reading that it's going to play tribute. Uh, what they're building is going to play tribute to uh, the, the original field that the uh, Sox played in. So that's another thing. Of, I, I have to wonder if we're going to hear that it'll be a long-term thing where they go there once a year. But, yeah, that would be a, that would be a fun experience uh, for sure from that standpoint. I would love to uh, – I'd love to have a chance to sit and uh, experience that one time. Yeah, don't wink at him, kid. That's that's one message to uh, to share. Uh, there's so many – there's so much from that movie. Oh, my gosh. That's uh, – I'm going to have to sit down and watch the movie again just to um, to get to certainly get ready for that one next year. But, uh, yeah, what, what a great thing for baseball to do. Yeah, again, you made a great point. They're trying to to close the gap a little bit. Um, I, I think that baseball has just gotten the, the popularity of it is getting dusted right now. You know, they've always had the ability to say, hey, this is America's game. It's America's pastime. And the money has taken it to a to another level where a lot of stadiums you're actually you're 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 pricing out the ability to go out and not not to the level of football, but you're still going out and having to pay a decent amount of money to take your kids to the baseball game, buy them a hot dog and a soda. So that is uh, definitely a good thing from a marketing standpoint. Hey, uh, real quick, my next one for you, and I know you're going to have a take on this, or I'm counting on you having a take on this. Carmelo, Carmelo Anthony and Team USA, I, this is happening here this week. 
Uh, and now uh, when they leave Vegas, they're going to go to L.A. But I was uh, a little surprised that when Carmelo reached out to see about playing, that he found the door closed. And I, I just wanted to I'll let you go first. What was your take on that? I'm not surprised. Um, Carmelo is not getting any NBA teams interested either. Uh, th- this Team USA, I mean, they need to, you know, they need to put the best players on the field and uh, or on the court. And, um, you know, I, I, you know, there's there's questions about Carmelo and and his his quick breakup with the Rockets last year. Was it really his fault as much? I mean, they had that horrible start. Um, they had other issues. They had some injury issues early in the season, and and maybe over relied on Carmelo. A bit, uh, and then and then and then made him the scapegoat when things didn't go well. But uh, you know, I'm I'm excited. I, I talked. Uh, in fact, I've got a couple other podcasts recorded and ready to go for the weekend. And one of them, I talked about Joe Harris. Joe Harris is on the the senior team. He might actually have a shot at making this this World Cup roster. Uh, I don't know, Carmelo. Uh, you know, uh, I'd like to see him get one more run. I, you know, an opportunity to sort of have the retirement tour, maybe that. We saw what Dwayne Wade and Dirk Nowitzki have uh, w- w- with the with their careers. I think Carmelo is, is is close to that level. Only problem being, of course, he didn't. You know, those two guys played with one team their whole career, and he did not um, for lots of different reasons. But you know, yeah, I I think the ship has sailed on Carmelo. Honestly, uh, you know, he he was always a guy, even when he was at his prime, he was an offensive machine. Uh, but you know, what was he the right teammate? Was he a defensive player at all? Uh, could he could he do much with within, within a team system? He could put the he could put the ball in the basket, but the ball needed to run through him. And you know, the, his best success was in Denver, uh, when they sort of kind of got him to play with the rest of the guys. When he went to New York to be the star, uh, he still put the numbers up, but they never won there. And so, you know, I don't know. I, I I'm not sure. If, if if you gave him a spot, it would be more of a it'd be more you're gifting him something than honestly him earning it, in my opinion. Well, it's it's kind of interesting and, and before I offer my thought process, I want to stipulate I'm not a fan. I it, it's something to where I don't dislike Carmelo Anthony, but I didn't like the the way he forced the breakup in Denver and I thought that George Carl had put together a team out there. But in my in my mind, not everybody. Chris, you mentioned Joe Harris. Not everybody that comes out there, not everybody that comes out there is guaranteed a spot on the final roster. And in my mind, and this this same question is going to lead into my lead into my next one. But what would it have hurt to let him come to Vegas and let him actually try out for the team? And then he, if he doesn't make it, then he doesn't make it. And with the, the number, of, the number of people who have had to, for various reasons, and everybody has a different reason, that have had to back out. I, I would have, I would have thought that they would have said, "Okay, Carmelo, we're we're not going to promise you a spot on the final roster, but if you want to come to Las Vegas and." Go through the tryouts. You're welcome to do that. I, I I kind of thought that's how it would play out because whether I'm a fan of him or not it doesn't change what he's done for the national team. Uh, you know, from a from a standpoint of the amount of medals that he's won, the amount of times that he went, even this is a big difference between the the fact that they even changed the name of it. There's a big difference between going to the Olympics and competing for the world championship. I, I, I feel like everybody wants to have a shot to go to the Olympics, but I feel like that if somebody's going to skip something, they're going to skip the, uh, you know, the world level of it. So I, I was kind of thinking in my own mind that they would say, hey, sure, you could come out and try out. I didn't see, I, I didn't see the public statement of saying, hey, yeah, we're just we're just going to go in a different direction. I, it just for me, it felt disrespectful to to not give him a chance because I don't I, I don't know what he could have done or not because his last two you mentioned Houston, the situation in Oklahoma City was a train wreck. Yeah, yeah. 
And uh, so I, I just was a little surprised. I, I felt like that it wouldn't have cost them anything other than some, some meal money, if you will, to say, hey, you can come out here and, uh, and, and try to make the team going to be interesting uh, they're, they're actually playing uh, a game tonight yeah. Yeah. down in T-Mobile right down the right down the street from me I did get a kick out of seeing the the majority of the players fly in and you know there's the, the day that uh, first day you took me to the ATC tournament we set at Press Row that was the first time you realize how big these guys are and how tall they are and how fast they are actually too yeah yeah and uh, so it was funny. You know, they happened to be the majority of them happened to be flying in uh, right around the time I was picking up my daughter at the airport, and seeing the people that were greeting them, holding up the signs, and they're normal sized people, and these, these guys getting off the plane. <laughs> it, it really makes you appreciate just how uh, how big and strong and athletic the game uh, ha- has become. Um, and my next one on that, on that thing, though, I was a little surprised because while I'm not, I don't consider myself a Carmelo Anthony fan, I do consider myself a Dabo Sweeney fan. Now, what was your take on the process of the public statements in regards to Bryant and Bryant not getting the ring? Well, I guess, I mean, first, often we, we – we uh, will read things from uh, about what, what people have said, and, and we think that they're saying them. Often, it's a response to a question. It was a it was a question was posed to Dabo, uh, so it's not. I don't I don't get the sense he was he's he's you know actively saying, hey, write a story about how I didn't want to give Kelly Bryant a championship ring. He was asked, did you give Kelly Bryant a championship ring, and he says no. Okay, so uh, so that, I think that's an important distinction, you know, just to point out. Second thing. Kelly Bryant doesn't deserve a championship ring, and I agree with Dabo on this one million percent. And here's why: he left the team, and not just left the team, you know, because he he remember back to when he left the team. It was after four games. Clemson's four and zero, but they're sputtering offensively. Trevor Lawrence is holding a clipboard, but everybody's saying Trevor Trevor Lawrence should get a shot. And so Dabo says he's my starting quarterback. First game where he's a starting quarterback, Syracuse game. Now, Bryant, Bryant in a huff says, I'm taking my ball and going home. First game where Lawrence is the quarterback goes down to injury in the second quarter. Now you're down to the third string guy, and you have to rally in, a, in, in the fourth quarter to beat Syracuse. You're down 23-13 in the fourth quarter to Syracuse, and you need your third string guy. Luckily, they, you know, they, they, they do. They, they come back and win the game, and they go on and win the championship. But if Kelly Bryant doesn't take his ball and go home, he's there. Hey, who knows? Maybe he he kind of like a, a, a Tua situation where Tua rallies Alabama to win the championship game uh, against Georgia a couple years ago. Maybe Bryant rallies him to win the game, and, and, and Dabo says, you know what? Maybe I made a mistake. Maybe Bryant should be my quarterback. He's my guy again. But he wasn't there. He wasn't even there as an option. So we had to win that game without you. That's the that's the game. If we lose that game, we're not we're not even in the playoff. No. Kelly Bryant, you don't deserve a ring. You left us when we needed you the most. I totally agree with Dabo on that. Yeah, I, I absolutely do as well. I just, it was surprising to me, Chris, it's what I would consider a slow news week uh-huh. by, by standards that it got that level of publicity. <laughs> because, you know, all you have to do is look at the Alabama situation with, uh, you know, with Hertz and see how somebody handles something with class. Yes. And I, I just, I felt like in my mind, it shouldn't even have been a question as to whether we got a ring because it just reminded me of, if I can't play, I'm taking my ball and I'm going home. And uh, I just, I didn't like the way it felt at all. And then you're sitting there as it's happening and great job of recapping the Syracuse game. You're sitting there going, Wow, I, I don't I, I don't know who the third string quarterback is. Yeah. But what's going to happen if that happens? So I, I was probably bigger and more surprised by the amount of coverage the quote got. I, I have no problem with his statement. No problem with the, the thought process. 
Yeah. You, I don't think you can reward somebody who literally walked out on your team yeah. at a time when you could have you could have been needed. The uh, <laughs> I'll give you a quick one here. Uh, the Antonio Brown mystery has finally been solved. Oh dear, yeah. I didn't. I didn't. Well, what's your quick take on not wearing the proper shoes when you're in the uh, what? Is, what is that thing called again? Uh, like a cryo cryo chamber or something like that. Yeah, the the basically the the, the cold air treatments that you could. Yeah, that. Um, you know, I watched Hard Knocks Tuesday night, uh, like a lot of folks probably did, and uh, you know, Brown is. I mean, it's 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 interesting. He's he's running. Pretty well. Uh, in fact, one of the storylines on the Hard Knock show was that they're trying to get him to slow down a little bit because he, he wants to go full speed, and and yet he's he, it's not it's not his his forty time. It's not his you know point A to point B speed that's the issue. It's it's his ability the the, the foot issue he has right now is it's his ability to cut, which of course for a receiver is pretty important. You got to be able got to be able to cut left, cut right, you know all this kind of thing, but. When you when you'd see him when when they would show him he he would burst on sprints but then yeah the cuts were were were, were a problem and uh, he was very gingerly cutting and you know so you're like wow what happened there and then you find out it was that boy I mean you know there are so many things available to you um, in terms of training and everything else and. I don't know. I mean, I haven't read more in, in depth about this to know if this is going to be a lingering issue. I mean, frostbite doesn't sound good. Just hope for his sake and for the Raiders' sake and, and, and their investment in him and that sake that uh, <laughs> that he will be able to play this year. I hope. I, I don't know that it's any more serious than like like a week or two or whatever. But you know, it could be. A, it could. This could be a lingering issue for them this year. Uh, it's gonna. It's gonna hurt a great deal. And Gruden is trying to do a nice job. Of masking it, the frustration in it. You, you know, you have this a year's worth of you let Khalil Mack over. You're an idiot, and he finally had a chance to quiet some of these skeptics by landing amongst other people, Antonio Brown. And I just uh, that's something else that you can do here. Obviously, we're watching the stadium get built every day, but it's actually a storefront where you can go in. And see all of the 3D layouts of the uh, of the place and exactly what it's going to look at. And to say it's going to have all the bells and whistles uh, again would be would be an understatement. Next one is going to real quick going to switch back to UVA football and buildings. And one of the things, not the 180 million dollar building, but the Mercedes Mercedes Benz building. Now, we've talked about the fact that Duke is going to be playing there here in just a little over a couple of weeks. And most people know that those games are scheduled two or three years out. So you've got to – the schedule came out officially this week in a lot of places. And you see the line, Virginia, Georgia, and the Chick-fil-A. Chris, it's worth worth the price of a ticket to get to be inside the building. Uh, and, you know, from a from a fan standpoint, I had a chance to do that last year when we were down there visiting um, Sabrina and her family. But my, my question is, as a football fan, and more importantly for you, as a UVA fan, what was your first thought when they announced the game? Then, by comparison, what's the thought now as the amount of improvement Virginia has shown in the two years since they announced the game? My, my smart aleck comment when they announced the game, it was well, a year or two ago they announced the game, uh, was, wow, they have more confidence in Bronco than I bet Bronco does because the ACC doesn't want to play that game, uh, you know, Labor Day night 2020 with Georgia pummeling UVA. They don't, you know, the ACC doesn't want that. The, honestly, not, ESPN doesn't want that. They want a good game. You don't want to put a primetime game on that's going to be basically a, a squash match. Uh, so... You know, so when that was when that was announced, I thought, well, uh, the ACC has confidence that Bronco will get this turned around by year five. Well, here we are, year four, and you know things have have, have gone more quickly. 
uh, than, than any of us ex uh, had estimated. Uh, and I would even probably put Bronco in that. I talked with him at the Belk Bowl uh, before the Belk Bowl last year, and he said, yeah, we're a year ahead of schedule as far as I'm concerned. So uh, so here we are entering year four for Bronco, and he's a, the favorite in the Coastal. And, and so you look ahead to, to, to next year. I mean, you know, of course, we have to play this whole season, but if this season goes anywhere close to expectations for EBA, and they do, you know, play in, play in Charlotte, uh, as a representative of the Coastal Division uh, in the in the AC Championship game, uh, you know, if that would probably mean you're at worst nine and three going into that game, uh, so lose to Clemson, you're nine and four, you play a bowl game, maybe you're ten and four when it's all over with. Yeah, you go into next year against a Georgia team that you have to presume because the way Kirby Smart's got things rolling there and the recruiting he's doing, they'll be once again a, a top five or top ten team at worst uh, going into 2020 you'll have probably two top 25 teams in that stadium uh, for that game. That'll be that'll be what both the SEC, ACC, and also ESPN want uh, out of that environment. It'll be a packed stadium, obviously with Georgia fans there, with some UVA fans. Atlanta's a good uh, a good alumni area for UVA fans. So uh, I've already, in fact, one of my college roommates said he's already he's, he's already committed to going to that game. He and his son are going to go to that game. So that's, that's a year off. So, uh, so there'll be a good UVA turnout there, but but yeah, I mean it's 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 a year off, but you know uh, a lot more excited about it now, Jerry. Honestly, than I was when it was first announced. I was thinking, man, this is going to be the this could be a fifty four seven beatdown, and it's going to be on the national TV, just going to embarrass the heck out of all of us, UVA, ACC, everybody. Uh, feel a little bit better about that right now. Well, it's kind of funny, Chris, because I have to admit when they announced the Duke Alabama game three years ago, I thought the same thing, <laughs> and now two weeks out. I still think the same thing. <laughs> it, it's something to where I, you know, and you're sitting in there. But the Georgia-Virginia game, because I actually took a minute and and did something I normally don't do a whole lot of. I actually went back and researched the series a little. And uh, it's Georgia 9, Virginia 7, with three ties. And uh, they, they, I, do, I do remember those two teams playing a couple of us. Uh, I want to say exciting Peach Bowl. Yes, yes. But I was pleasantly surprised that now they don't play a lot, but that Virginia um, has held its own. Now they snuck some of those wins in in the gap between uh, you know Vince Dooley and Kirby Smart. But still, I I, I like Virginia's chances. That now they're going to get a chance to play um, again. The building is is worth the, is worth the trip. In the fact that I think it's now it's slightly smaller than Jerry's World, and I've had a I've been fortunate enough to be in both of them. Uh, but wow, what a cool place, cool environment! And I think it's a the way a lot of the places are going to go now, Chris. Where there's a lot of room to stand, there's a lot of room to places to watch the game from a place other than your seat, and. It'll, it'll be a fun watch uh, if you get a chance to go down there. Uh, it should be a fun watch and a fun game. Uh, last note on the football, and I like Dabo's comments on this again this week. And I, I, had, I didn't hear Alabama say it, so I'm not saying that Alabama said it. But what, what's your take on the amount of noise about Clemson only beat up on Alabama because Alabama was worn out from playing in the SEC? Yeah, I, I like I like Dabo's point about that. Uh, the SEC isn't what the SEC was. He didn't say it this way, but five years ago, it's you know he doesn't have to play Georgia every year. So the SEC West hasn't lived up uh, in the last several years. LSU hasn't beaten Alabama since 2012. Uh, they recruit great and don't win at those games. They they're not competitive. They lost 29 nothing to, to Alabama last year. Uh, Ole Miss and Mississippi State have not been competitive. Uh, as they were uh, back, back uh, you know, several years ago. Uh, Arkansas, not competitive. Uh, and so, you know, it'll be a little different this year. I think Texas A&M is going to be better, uh, and, and they're in that division. So uh, LSU thinks they'll be better, so we'll see if there's more competition there. But, no, last year, you know, with the schedule they played, they only played Georgia uh, in the championship game. You know, they, 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 they played a weak SEC West uh you know the the East. They didn't have to play Georgia until the until the important game, and they and they had to rally and win that one. So, no, it's you know the ACC certainly is is not 
you know, competitive uh, outside of Clemson. You know, Syracuse, we mentioned a little earlier in the podcast, they, you know, took advantage of, of injury and flux and everything else and almost beat uh, Clemson for what, what would have been a second straight year in that series. Uh, that, that matchup this year is, is week three. Keep an eye on that one. That's going to that's gonna be a fun one in the ACC Atlantic. But uh, outside of Syracuse, you know, there, there was nobody in the Coastal, certainly, who was going to be competitive with, with Clemson last year. And NC State could have been more competitive uh, last year. They had a, a six-year senior quarterback and, you know, defense with a lot of guys back. And they just, you know, that game, that, did, that didn't go as well uh, last year as it could have for, for, for NC State. But, but no, the idea that the, the SEC has been coasting on reputation for, for quite a while uh, – you know, if 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 it, if not for the size of these conferences, and if, if if every like back in the old days when you had eight nine team conferences and everybody played everybody, uh, you could say, oh yeah, well look, there's Georgia, there's Alabama, but but you know, no, it's it's, it's it's not it's not what it was a few years ago. It may be this year. It might not be this year. ACC might be tougher this year, for all we know. Uh, the Syracuse uh, coming off a ten win season, maybe I, I think Syracuse will be will be solid again this year. I like Boston College this year, a surprise team. They might be an eight or nine win team this year in the in, in the in the Atlantic or the, in the Coastal. I like Virginia. I like Miami uh, as two teams who I think can, can can do some special things this year. So hey, you know, uh, but no, the SEC last year it, it's it's just a ridiculous narrative being advanced by SEC homers, and uh, you know, that's what they do. That's fine. But Clemson kicked Alabama's ever living crap out of them last year. And, uh, you know, that's shocking. So we have to explain it somehow. So let's just write it off as Alabama was tired. I think they still had – both teams had played the week before in a playoff game. They both had had four weeks off before that. Uh, I, You know, tired? They were they were all fully healthy as far as I know. Uh, Alabama just, just got their butts beat. Well, it was kind of interesting. Like I said, I haven't seen that noise coming out of Alabama, but – it was funny, obviously, somebody saying it, and I had to smile because we started, you know, with a wrestling story, and about the pick, there was no doubt in my mind that Clemson was going to win that game last year, but it almost looked like it was Fick. It was it was such a one-sided beatdown that, you know, it's like the, the boxing story where the, the boxer says, hey, I'm going to go three rounds and take a dive. I, you know, it was just, I, I remember the game thinking, wow, I, you know, what, what is going on here? But it was, it was pretty wild to see. And I loved, uh, again, yeah, I loved Dabo's response as far as, as, uh, you know, how he answered back to that. But hey, another, uh, Virginia football question for you. The Falcons played their second, uh, preseason game last night. And obviously, I think most, Diehard Cavs fans know that you've got two UVA quarterbacks on that roster. And if you're going to play GM for a minute, take it into consideration that Matt Schaub is 38. And then you got the Burke is obviously much, much younger. If you're, if you're playing GM for the Falcons, your two UVA QBs, which one of them are you keeping? Well, I'll tell you, there's actually news on this. We wrote a story on the website earlier today. Uh, Binkert uh, is actually on injured reserve. Uh, he got injured in last week's game. Uh, he had a great game, 19 of 34 pass on 185, one touchdown. Uh, but he, he, he went out with it. Well, at the time, didn't look like a serious injury. And, in fact, it was uh, – so that game was last Thursday night. It was finally Tuesday where the Falcons determined uh, that the, the toe injury he suffered – required surgery that would keep him out of the season. And, and the bad news for, for both the Falcons and for Binkert is that the thought was, they from from everything I've read, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution had an article on this uh, yesterday, uh, everything I've read, the Falcons thought that Binkert would, would emerge from camp as the guy, as the number two guy. That was their thought going in, was was Shaw was there as insurance, but Binkert, uh, you know, he went through camp with the Falcons last year, he was signed to their practice squad, worked with the practice squad all season long, learning the offense, studying, you know, working with Matt Ryan and, and, and being in that quarterback's room. And then, of course, he has all the offseason. He has the spring. He has mini camps. The thought was 
you know, they were going to audition him. That's why he played so much last week. He threw 34 passes. It was it was to give him that opportunity to earn the number two job. And so now, now Schaub, yeah, you mentioned 38 years old. I mean, now Schaub is he was the insurance policy for a reason. He's there. Uh, they signed Matt Sims to basically you know play, I mean, to, to help run camp. Uh, you know, to to, to you know, have another quarterback in camp and have another guy. Uh, for mop-up duty and preseason action. Matt, Matt Ryan has not played yet in, in either of the two preseason games for the Falcons. So, uh, but yeah, Bank, Bankert was was penciled in, penciled in, not pinned in, but penciled in as the uh, the guy the Falcons wanted to be the number two guy. And they're still high on him. Uh, the surgery apparently is successful, you know, no complications or anything else. So it's looking like another year of sitting in the quarterback room uh, studying, uh, but not getting the physical reps like he got last year with the practice squad. But the Falcons still look like uh, they're very interested in having Baker compete for that number two job next year. So I'll answer the question with the way the Falcons, the Falcons themselves, Gary, were looking at at Kirk being the guy, and, and unfortunately for him, injuries happen. And, and so now the other guy, the other UVA guy, Matt Shaw, will have one more year, uh, apparently, uh, to be the backup in Atlanta. But it's going to be interesting to see uh, how the future plays out there because, the, you know, Schaub has always been a very uh, likable QB. And it's uh, one of the things about Matt Ryan is it's very similar to, you know, when Favre was, you know, quarterback. You, you've got somebody that's going to take the majority of the snaps has managed to, for the most part, to be injury-free. So, Job has had a has had a nice career in the NFL without having his uniform get incredibly messed up a whole lot. So I think it'll be it'll be neat to see him get to go uh, one more year. I wanted to sneak a funny one in real quick, or not funny, but funny sad. Before I turn over the next real question to you, I don't know if you saw that the Argentina Argentina women's team playing in the Pan Am Games. Yeah. They actually had to forfeit their game, which knocked them out of medal contention because they showed up with the wrong uniforms and didn't have access to changing them inside of the time limit. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, they had 15 minutes. to. to they were wearing the white road uniforms and they needed the blue home uniforms and they had 15 minutes and didn't have the time. And yeah, didn't a coach and a play, like the director of, of team personnel or something both quit as a result of this yeah they actually both uh both ended up offering the resignation and yeah. some of them took took full blame for the for the thought process i just have to wonder what that would have been like to have been in the arena waiting for that to happen now it didn't it did not eliminate them from the tournament it only eliminated them from metal contention they were actually able to keep playing but um, and the big one, to me, uh, all the basketball that we talk, the question here is the new rule, and just to recap real quick before you answer this, the thing that the NCAA did this year, different from years past, is they allowed the players to sign with an agent okay, and still come back to school. That was, that was new this year. So they're constantly trying to tweak this thing to make sense out of it. And then they pass another layer of the rules. And, of course, anybody who's a fan of Rich Paul, uh, starting with LeBron James, is calling this the Rich Paul rule. And, Chris, this is uh, – you're the first person I thought about when I heard this. What they're talking about here, basically, they're saying, hey, we like that idea. We're still going to let you do it. But we're going to require that the agent you signed with meet – all of these qualifications, and one of the qualifications is you have to have at least a two-year college degree. And I wanted to get your take on the thought process when it was announced. I was blown away. Here's what I was blown away by. I just assumed, without ever having researched it, that agents were all lawyers. Like, that, that they had not only a, a, a two-year degree or even a four-year degree, but that they had law degrees. Because I don't know that I want somebody representing my interest in a contractual situation that, you know, can't read a contract. I mean, I, I, 
you know, I, I went to law school for a semester. I, I, fortunately for me, I'm not a lawyer, so I can respect myself at night, I guess. But but contract law is not easy. It's you know that was that was a hard class. <laughs> I mean, with the intricacies of of what people sneak in in clauses and contracts and whether or not those those clauses themselves are are, are, are legal and, and and that kind of thing. I mean, and not just in, in dealing with the team because your agent doesn't just deal with your team. I mean, a lot of cases, you know, yeah, your rookie contract is set out by, you know, the NBA bargain agreement, and you know, there's a little bit of wiggle room, but not a lot. And but then, but then at that second contract and subsequent contracts, there are a lot of details that have to be worked out. I mean, we just saw one case this week where, you know, the uh, when when Russell Westbrook left uh, Oklahoma City and, and and went to Houston, you know, his agent, he and his agent agreed to defer some money down the line. And the weird thing is, you know, the money deferred doesn't actually help Houston in, in terms of salary cap. It was helping the owner, you know. So, like, I'm sure it was presented to them as, hey, here you go, help the team out. We can go sign another player. But it doesn't, you know. I want I want somebody representing me who can read that and knows it, you know. And so I was blo- – I'm just blown away that, like, one, that you can, you can even be an agent, a certified agent, without having – Without having that, that seems to me like a basic thing that you that you would have a law degree in these jobs. So, you know, so all the hue and cry over whether or not Rich Paul can, you know, represent guys. I mean, I, I don't know. You know, to me, the standards are way too low. Even with what they're setting here, much less, you know, poor Rich Paul can't represent people. He, he he's basically, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to assail the guy, but he's a street he's a street hustler who, who got lucky and met LeBron James. And you know, and and good for him, great for him, awesome for him, but nah, you know, dude, you you would not be an agent in any other field except for this one because of the lax rules in place. Well, I, I was I was equally surprised that somebody, especially like LeBron James, we're not talking about my salary or your salary. Yeah. We're talking about more money than we're ever going to see in our lifetime. I, I was surprised that, I mean, especially the amount of stories that you hear about people getting swindled, and some of them are, yeah. you know, pr- pretty substantial amounts. And I just, just feel like that there's there's three parts. There's three parts to LeBron. There's, there's his game, which speaks for itself. There's everything that he does off the court, which also speaks for itself. But I, I just can't get on board with what I feel is him trying to absolutely run the game as well. And it, it's a situation for me. I, I, I just it happened. To, I, I would be curious as to what his take on this one have been if that wasn't his guy that they felt was being saved out. You know, we, you and I talked last week about, you know, uh, the former uh, uh, boss man in Cleveland, you know, Griffin's talking about making his comments. I, it wasn't, it was probably within the hour after you and I had talked, not that he had anything to do with it, but an hour later, he was having to explain those responses. And, you know, part of that came from the fact that LeBron, uh, tweeted some stuff out, so there's that social media angle when things began, but it was interesting because on the surface, I like the fact that the NCAA is trying to deal with a situation that's not going away, yeah. and it's not just about the one and done anymore. We had situations with you know, UVA players this year, you know, Kyle Guy. I love the fact that he had, he had an option. He had an option to stick his toe in the water and still come back. I think that was a good move. And I, I felt like they made a decision to allow people to continue to make that move and be protected doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So that one that one there was uh, was kind of a, a surprise to me. I wouldn't picture you would want somebody who wasn't, again, you know, somebody who has read the paperwork, dotted the I's, crossed the T's, uh, last thought uh, for me, and I'll let you. I'll let you run with this one. It's a little bit more along your line than mine, but 
we wouldn't be doing it justice if we didn't ask what your take was on Kenny Stills kind of going after the owner of the team that he plays for. Um, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm, my, my thought is, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I support him saying everything he said. Um, he, uh, and, and him doing so is probably going to put his livelihood in jeopardy at some point. He's under contract now, so he'll get paid, uh, you know, for, for the duration, I'm sure, of his contract now. But we saw what happened to Colin Kaepernick. Colin Kaepernick was, has essentially been blackballed from the league. There are a lot of awful quarterbacks who get recycled <laughs> and have been recycled uh, several times over since Kaepernick last took a snap for the uh, 49ers a few years ago. Um, and uh, he's he's not being overlooked because of his supposed inability to play quarterback at the NFL level. Uh, and so, uh, but, you know, I, I, I admire, and we talked about LeBron James just a minute ago and kind of glossed over what we the, what we admire about LeBron off the court is his uh, his willingness to uh, use his platform to advocate for social justice, um, and you know in the case of of the New York Jets, uh, it's it's hard to reconcile uh, the owner of that team claiming to support uh, similar uh, improvements in our social condition and our political condition, cultural condition, uh, and also be a major fundraiser for Donald Trump. And so uh, I think more players should stand up and be counted in this respect. And yes, if if fans don't want to watch the games as a result, don't watch the games. Uh, but uh, I, you know, the, the athletes I admire from, from history – uh, I don't remember these guys, and Jerry, you might remember some of them from your childhood because you're a few years older than me, um, but Jackie Robinson died in 1972. I was born in 1972, so I don't remember Jackie Robinson at all. But, you know, Jackie Robinson, uh, not just for breaking the color barrier, but then being outspoken for the rest of his life afterwards. Uh, Jim Brown, uh, you know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, there was a great HBO documentary actually put together by LeBron James uh, production company on Muhammad Ali. Uh, athletes who, and in, in Muhammad Ali's case, he, he missed five years of the prime of his career because of his outspoken stance on the Vietnam War. Uh, I, those are the people I admire the most. You know, I love everything that goes on the field or on the court, uh, whatever the place may be. Um, you know, talking about what the exploits of the players is, is a great part of it, but you know, they're not doing themselves justice if they don't then take whatever fame they get from their exploits on these fields and try to do something good with it. And I, I admire people who stand up. And again, it's not it's not a case of uh, you know, people will say freedom of speech. Yes, the young man's got the freedom of speech to say what he has to say, and then the NFL could blackball him like they did Kaepernick, and I. Don't, I wouldn't be surprised if they don't. Uh, that 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 makes you know. I, I remember learning uh, in my twelfth grade government class the definition of civil disobedience, and it's not that you have the right to go protest. Uh, you have the right to go protest, and you know I, I actually took a, a history of civil rights class as a as a third year student at UVA, taught by Julian Bond, the late former head of the NAACP, and he talked about how. Uh, when they were training the, the student protesters in the early 60s at the height of the civil rights movement, um, look, you're going to get arrested. You're going to get beaten. You're going to have water hoses turned on you. You're going to have uh, you know, all kinds of – you might get murdered out here. Um, so you know, your right to civil disobedience doesn't mean that you're going to be protected. Um, you know, a football player saying his owner is, is um, hypocritical. Uh, is is not what those folks went through. It's not what people go through every day, but it's it's what they can do, and they can use their platform in a good way. I admire the heck out of it. Hey, just real quick for anybody that uh, that was that was paying as close of attention as I was, just wanted to note it's the Miami Dolphins that Phil's plays for. The fundraiser was in New York, but it's not the Jets, but the Dolphins. But 
I, I was, again, I, I'm a lot less of uh, stick by cup on the political end of it, but I gave him credit in my mind for standing up for what he believes in. That's not always the easiest thing to do. It's not always the, the popular thing to do. But uh, I, I was pretty sure that you would, uh, as far as having a, a wrap-up point in the conversation, that that was going to be a pretty good one in my head. That was when that story broke. I was sitting there going, okay, here's somebody who didn't take the easy way out. And and, and for my, for my generation, you know, or, or the people I grew up with, you mentioned people in the past. Chris, that was the one thing that people not Michael Jordan for. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he tried to make light of it every now and then by saying, well, Democrats buy shoes and Republicans buy shoes. But it, 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 was a, it wasn't a normal thing. And as much as I love Michael Jordan, you're, you're sitting there, and that was the one rap against him was, hey, he wasn't, he wasn't there trying to stand for something. Yeah, he was playing golf and selling shoes. Yeah, yeah. And again, he might have earned that by, you know, playing basketball the way that he did. But I, I just, when I read that, I read that story. Not knowing anything about the young man, I, I can't even tell you where he went to school. Yeah, and I, I just remember. I just thought. I go, wow. I go, that's making a statement. You're in a situation to where you see a lot of people talk about other people, you know, management groups or ownership groups, but to feel comfortable and believe in something strong enough to take that chance, I thought that was a that would be a good way to wrap to yeah. wrap it up to have a have a, a story where somebody is standing up for what they believe in and we'll see how the consequences play out after that. Yeah, I, and I thank you for bringing it up here because it's been something that I've been trying to do more, I mean, not on the podcast end of things, but more on the Augusta Free Press, the, the, the reporting end of things and the writing end of things. You know, we get a lot of great traffic from people who especially like UV, cover, uh, follow UVA sports, uh, you know, our, our, in our local news and everything else. Um, and we, you know, and I've come to be, I've started, you know, kind of banning about my head. We get great traffic. We have a great, you know, our, our web metrics are through the roof. I mean, it, we're very fortunate that we, all the years of hard work are paying off in that respect. Um, and then I, I think, you know, what do I do? I mean, you know, I, 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 I think we're at a place that a lot of us, you know, we, we don't like how things are going right now. I don't, and I'm not just talking about, you know, if you're Republican, you're Democrat, whatever else. The, the, where our country is right now in terms of how at each other's throats we seem to be, there are people at the top who are pushing those buttons and making it happen because it benefits them. And it, that, that bothers me and, you know, um, to a point where I'm not, I'm not at the level of NFL wide receiver who makes millions – uh, putting that on the line, but you know, at some point you have to stand up and be counted. And you know, so we've we've become a little more vocal uh, on these issues too. Um, it's uncomfortable where our country is right now, and I don't know that me saying something alone or a wide receiver saying something alone, but if more of us say we're not going to accept this out of our America. Uh, you know, the more the more of us who become part of a, a cacophony, um, maybe maybe it can change things. And I, you know, I, 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 the Republican Democrat part of this is, is what it is. You know, but the basic lack of respect that people have right now for each other, for immigrants, for people of color, for women, is unacceptable to me. It's unacceptable to millions of people. And we've got to be counted. And I admire LeBron James in that respect. I, I root against LeBron James, a basketball player. I'll just I'll just say it that way. I and, and I have this weird dichotomy of I root against LeBron, the player. I love LeBron, the, the businessman and social activist. Um, you know, Colin Kaepernick, the quarterback, he had decent numbers. Uh, Colin Kaepernick, the social activist, man, he changed the world. Um, and so Ed Reed, his his speech at the Hall of Fame. Oh my gosh, you know. Um, people need to be counted, uh, and if and, and, and I want to be part of those. I want to be part of that. So, thank you, Jerry, for bringing that up because you know it, it is an awkward conversation to have. Dan Lebertard 
almost lost his job a couple weeks ago for having a similar take. Um, fortunately for me, I'm not going to fire myself. So Augusta Free Press, I'm good. But uh, but yeah, it, it, this is a time to be counted, and uh, it's a conversation we need to have and continue to have as well. Well, it, it's interesting, Chris, because I'll, I'll add at, at my closing note when I, I, I follow a lot of things in the world of sports, and I, I read a lot, listen a lot, and and what I try to do is I try to pick out 15 or 16 thought processes that stick out to me enough that it gives you an opportunity to kind of run the run the gauntlet on giving a thought here or there. And one of the reasons that I picked that one in the order to be the last one is because I felt it was actually of everything we talked about from the opening line of Daniel Jones going five for five to to me, it was the thing that had the most relevance. And it was something for me where still was concerned. I have to give him. I have to give him kudos because that's not something that everybody's going to do. It's a situation to where, and like I said, where LeBron's concerned, his stuff off the court is is through the roof. I I, I love everything he's trying to do for our country off the court. My only issue with LeBron is I think he's trying to run the NBA. <laughs> you know, I'm okay. I'm okay with him retiring from basketball starting as a state representative and working his way up. And I just, you know, I kind of like to let Adam Silver run the NBA. <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad we had that as, as a closing note. And uh, I will look forward to getting through stuff for another week and uh, see what pops up. Yes, well, thanks to Jerry and all your cards and letters to Jerry Carter. Uh, the uh, And for our listeners out there, too, uh, if, you, if you're if uh, you listening to this podcast, we have a couple others for you to listen to this weekend as well. I did a, a long podcast on VMI's Football Media Day and uh, and then also a UVA sports podcast kind of wrapping some of the week in UVA sports, such as it is in the, middle, in the middle of the summer. So thanks to Jerry. Thanks to you for listening. And everyone, have a great weekend.